yes, welcome, Jane Collins and Jane Bennett. I'm so excited to um, have you both here on my initial conversation here. <laughs> thank you, Adriana. It's an honor. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Great to be here with you. Oh, beautiful. I, um, I really wanted to start by just sharing a little bit of um, my relationship with you both and how I got to know you both and the way that my connection with you has shaped not only my, um, well, it shaped my life really, but um, from that point on, but also um, what started then and what is this now, this conversation that we're having. So I'm going to, um, um, no, I was just, before we do that, I think I just wanted to invite us to, to drop in. So before I introduce you both, maybe we can just check in. We can do a, ch a quick check in even before I introduce you both, how we're we feeling in the moment. Um, maybe I'll just, I'll just start by saying that I, I noticed that I'm a little bit nervous. Um, and this is the first conversation I'm having for this new project that I'm birthing. And um, I'm a little bit nervous also because I care a lot about this. So I notice emotion coming up. And um, yeah, and I care about it. Uh, I care about how it's perceived. I, I think there is a lot of misunderstanding. And I think that part of my role, part of my, that I have been um, discovering in my trajectory and the things that interest me is uh, the weaving maybe of the masculine and the feminine in me. So part of making discernment and clarity and, and unpicking things so that people understand and it's not a sweeping generalization and it's not in the box of too hard or in the box of of women's stuff or in the box of uh, silly stuff or unnecessary stuff or whatever mm -hmm. the box is that is put in. <laughs> I wanna get it out of there and bring it into the table of conversation with serious people. <laughs> whatever, this, whatever this frame is that we have created in our modern day world in which, um, you know, systems have been created by serious people and some other conversations are not had there. They're not had there, they're had somewhere else. I, I, I think it's important that other conversations are here. So I'm trying to bridge some worlds that usually don't meet in, in at least in my <laughs> arena. Mm. So, um, so that makes me nervous because it's almost the opposite of the path of least resistance is the path of <laughs> most resistance sometimes you know but it seems to be my attraction so i'm just honoring it and it also makes me nervous so uh, i feel just better by sharing my sharing my nervousness yeah mm. shall i go first mm. well that wouldn't really be yes. the right way because B comes before C, so over to you, Ms. Jane. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> only just, so only just. Only just. <laughs> yeah. Look, I'm I'm feeling really delighted to be here with you both. Before we started, I was, you know, I have to-do lists and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so I was trying to get a few things done, so I was a little bit rushed and kind of my head was in there. But as soon as I came on and you're both here and you know, you, we started talking, I, can, I feel myself dropping into a, a different space. And you know, so I'm really looking forward to our conversation and you know, the richness that I know it will be. <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna say, but you know, it'll, it'll come. So <laughs> lovely, really lovely to be here. Thank you. And my check-in right here, right now, I'm feeling the dark moon. So we're in the final 40 minutes of the dark moon. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that we will be having this conversation over that threshold. I should go that way, actually. <laughs> and um, that now is the, like, the time when 
everything comes to a point, you know, like it's sort of the threshold of death and rebirth. So mm. it's the old mm. and the new coming together. And that's kind of what we're talking about, really, isn't it? It's a kind of a reclamation and bringing this important information out of, you said a box, I would say the dungeon. The patriarchy mm. dungeon is where this information is, and mm. we need to bust in and get it out. So I'm super excited to be doing this mm. conversation with both of you. Jane Bennett and I are um, long time, long term co conspirators in this women's mysteries <laughs> world. And Adriana, <laughs> you and I have spent many, 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 many hours together doing mm. the actual work. So it's it's wonderful to be here with you both now. Thanks so much. Mm. Oh, it's beautiful to hear you and I feel calmer. <laughs> and I love <laughs> I love the coincidence that it's the dark moon. I mean, we didn't even know this when we planned, but that this whole threshold, I love it. Dark moon and then to the into the new moon, it'll be the end of our conversation. It's beautiful. So I want to just mm. share a little bit of, about my a trajectory with you both and how I got to know you both and then um, and why I think it's important why I, I invited you to to start this conversation with me and uh, and then I'd love to invite you both to uh, share a bit of your journeys and where you're at now because it has been a big journey of I imagine it hasn't been um, something that you dreamt as a child going I know what I'm going to work with and you know what you do now <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to know that also. I think it's very beautiful to contextualize that. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I came in contact first with Jane Collins and it was through a friend and I had never heard of her work. I come from a very medicalized culture. I'm from Brazil and I come from a very medicalized upbringing. Um, one of my dear aunties is a doctor, gynecologist, obstetrician. She's my mom's sister. So I was exposed to a very medicalized model of um, seeing the body and, and, and my relationship with the body. So when I came to Australia, I, so I was petrified of giving birth my whole life. And um, when I came to Australia, I started meeting women. So even though Australia is still medicalized, it's very different than Brazil. It's still more natural than Brazil. And I started meeting women. They were not radical women. They were normal women. They birthed naturally. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a very important thing because that was, um, before I just thought I wanted to push the envelope with everything. So I was just like, oh, maybe it's me. And when I met normal women that had given birth naturally, I was like, oh, that's a possibility. So then I met Jane through a friend and I went to do your workshop, your pregnancy workshop, and that's 11 years ago now. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, um, and I remember being fascinated at first, like the, the, the way that, yeah, I think in the flyer of your workshop, it was something like shamanic and pregnancy together. And that to me was a new thing. I was just like shamanism and pregnancy. <laughs> it, just, it just blew my world. And then I came and a few different things happened in that workshop, but one of them was just the fact that I was sitting with women and the women that I was sitting with had a different way and a different relationship with their bodies. And the fact that a natural birth was just talked about as nothing, as a natural thing. That for me, I had never experienced that in the context of a group. Like, oh, all of us shared that? That was a very new culture for me. And I, so from then on, I, I, I took that on and I was like, I'm going to run with this. You know, if there are people that believe in that, that's probably possible. And, and then um, it took me to the birth of my child. It took me to do the four seasons journey, the whole year long program with you, Jane. Then I went to train and do the um, rite of passage for girls, um, training year-long training with you Jane Collins and then I mean there's much more in between that that we might weave um during this conversation because through that time I was also so sparked by the whole female rite of passage 
um, about the, the power of it, really. I was stunned by, I was in my 30s, and the fact that I had lived my whole life up to that point numb to it completely. And the noticing of the difference that it made in my life when I woke to it, I just thought everybody would love that information. And I was very mistaken in, in that piece that I thought that everybody was just like, wow, of course. And I was just like, oh, okay. So that's one piece. But um, so then I went to train with Jane. And then from that work, I was led a few people that had trained with me uh, uh, doing in this rite of passages for girls world, introduced me to Jane Bennett. Jane Bennett's work. And also Jane, I had come across your work with the pill, with the bo book on, on the pill that you had done, mm -hmm. which I thought was uh, amazing. Jane Collins um, would talk about this book and there were, I think other maybe books mm -hmm. that you had written. So I was, I, I came across your work in that way. And then I reached out to you to do um, the Rite of Passage to Girls workshops with you, the training with you, which is a different training and it deepened my understanding. It comes from a, a little bit of a different angle and I, um, yeah, just really loved it. And I also loved um, doing the training with you about how to talk to fathers about it. I remember being really, there was something that sparked me because I've always been drawn to talking to um, the unlikely person about the menstrual cycle mm -hmm. and, and talking to fathers and, mm -hmm. and realizing this openness. There is a point in men's lives in which that becomes relevant when they have a daughter mm -hmm. going through that and they start losing um, the connection with them. So, so this was very, very fundamental in, in, um, in my relationship with, with the menstrual cycle, in the, my relationship to birthing, in my relationship to perimenopause and menopause and, and the whole trajectory that both of you paint, um, I think is just um, fundamental. And, and I, I think it's vital actually, vital um, knowledge that needs to come out. So that's, that's one of the pieces I, I think I'm, I'm feeling really drawn in this um, conversation that I started with my check-in in the world, in the context where I'm, um, interested to be in which often has a lot of men or often has a lot of uh rational thinking and this piece is of, often missed completely entirely it doesn't even go there and I don't think it's um in the past year I saw that it's not just um um I had I had made a, a um I had believed that everybody hated it but actually I met quite a few men they were like, oh, I never thought about it. They were, they were really sad. They were like, I never thought of this being anything. So I was like, oh, really? Okay, so maybe you need to start thinking about it. So maybe let's start having these conversations <laughs> in, these, in these places. So that's the reason why I invited you both. And I'd love now to invite you to share a bit of your work and how you got to whatever you did before you do this to what you do now. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you, Jane. Uh, I just so lovely to hear your story, Adriana, and, and your journey um, so far. I, I think I'll start with, you know, where this really started for me and and similar similar to you you know there was a moment of kind of the lights going on and and waking up and i would say that was when i was in my mid-20s i uh learned the methods of natural fertility management uh as a way to understand my cycle and for the purpose of contraception so up until that point i'd had a fairly conventional journey with contraception uh i had been on the pill a couple of times which you know i i didn't like how i felt i didn't have any major symptom you know side effects but it didn't feel very good i then had an iud <clears throat> Uh, I didn't like how that made me feel and I had a lot of pain uh, and then a friend put me onto a diaphragm which actually of all of those I thought was fabulous um, you know it was it was very comfortable it was I didn't need anything when I wasn't needing it when I wasn't needing contraception so you know it, it fit a lot of those uh, bills 
And, uh, but then I heard of the work of Francesca Nash. I was in Sydney at the time. I was working at a clinic with her and uh, started to learn about her work with fertility awareness and thought it sounded amazing. However, it still took me two years to actually, you know, knock on her door and make a time and, and go to see her. And I have to say, it took the encouragement or, or the support of a new boyfriend as well. Uh, we knew of Francesca, you know, we were keen to do that together. And that, that really made the difference uh, for me and helped give me the confidence to do that together. So we went to see her in those days. This was the, the mid 80s. So uh, we had, uh, she gave us an audio tape with some, some information. We had Ronio sheets. If anyone knows what Ronio is, it's sort like of purplish <laughs> colour print. <laughs> and uh, she talked us through the cycle and uh, I got a thermometer. So I went home, uh, you know, read the information just to, <coughs> just to refresh and then I uh, started charting so every morning I would take my temperature and log that um, I was also checking my uh, mucus uh, cervical mucus but from the uh, entrance to the vagina every time I went to the loo um, and then making a note of that every day and uh, you know so I was pretty keen and interested so I was pretty good at, at putting these symptoms out and also other secondary symptoms so after several weeks and then, you know, getting into the second month, I started to see the pattern. I could start to see, oh, look, that's when I ovulated. Or I can look retrospectively, you know, when my temperature goes up, it's gone up for three days. I can go, oh, that's likely to be the day. What does my mucus look like then? Oh, okay, that's, that's, that's what's happening there. Now, there are general patterns, but of course, doing that uh, lab work, if you like, for yourself means that uh, for me, I was learning what my pattern looked like what my pattern of temperature rise was like, what my pattern of mucus was like. Those are the two main symptoms, but there was also position, position of my cervix. There was also other secondary symptoms, you know, when, when I was having maybe low energy or low mood or higher energy and, and higher mood, uh, when I had, when I had head, headaches or digestive um, disturbance, things like that. So I was making a note of all of these and it was like, um, you know, several metaphors here, but it was like a veil was lifting. It was like suddenly I was getting the map. The map was appearing before me that I could understand my, myself through and my life through. And uh, so I, I often uh, would say that this, this was all like a, you know, a slow running over these weeks and a couple of months of an epiphany of, oh my God, this is amazing. This, to, to really have this awareness. And the second main uh, response and feeling, similar to what you were saying, Adriana, is that why, why wasn't I told this earlier? Why didn't I start to get this information at 13? Not that I needed it for contraception then, but you know, to know why I was having these changes of, of mucus during the months, rather than spending my teens thinking oh my god there's something wrong with me this is so embarrassing you know i've got to wipe 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 it's the way it's like it's pretty simple you know it's it's a natural normal part of the uh fertility cycle and it's great and it's healthy so uh to me you know there were there were multiple understandings like this so i have to say it's a wave i'm still on <laughs> um, um, the, the, the curiosity and the interest and the ongoing learning is, is still there. So um, I, I, one of my responses, you know, was also a degree of anger of, of why wasn't, you know, why, why, weren't, why don't we get this? And the truth is nobody knew it at that time. Uh, you know, my mum didn't know it to tell me or, I mean, obviously she would have known more about fertility than me at that age, but um, it just wasn't a cultural thing to share that. It was like minimum information. Here's a pad. This is what you do with it. You know, job done. Um, so, you know, I then went on a journey of, 
you know, many years, and I'm still doing work with Francesca Nash. <laughs> uh, but soon after that, I said, this is amazing. You know, we've got to share this with more people. Um, and there were, there were some other movements um, at that time working with uh, the methods of fertility awareness. Francesca first learned it for herself in 1975. Uh, but to my knowledge, she was the first in Australia that uh, learnt the methods but removed it from uh, a religious context and so her, for her it was more about uh, women's empowerment um, and natural health mm -hmm. and and that's still the case for her she has a clinic in sydney and these days is more often helping people uh women and couples with uh preconception health care with natural fertility in all forms so so that's what she does so she's uh, she's also offering a lot of treatment as well uh, but that's really where where it started and so i i really wanted to work with her we started uh, she was trained me in these methods um, and at, at such a time as i left sydney um, i was offering these methods to women as well and also equally excited thinking oh my goodness this is amazing for everybody um, and of course i did have uh, some wonderful uh, clients and to, to really share this excitement with but we are so trained in our society we I, I like to use the word sometimes a miasm which is which is kind of often used in homeopathy as there's this there's this fog <laughs> there's this fog of um of unknowing a fog of unconsciousness and it it gives us the message that this is not something to know there's, there's nothing to see here. Um, this is, uh, we will take care of it for you, uh, rather than the empowerment of, hey, just a minute, I can be the expert of my own body. I can be the expert of my own experience. I can create meaning out of that and manage that for myself. Um, if I need professional help, I will employ you for what I need from you. <laughs> it's a very different understanding. So. And this, this miasm extends through education, it extends through healthcare, uh, it extends through you know, the conversations we have at, excuse me, at work or in our communities. Um, you know, there is change afoot. There is much more activism, much more conversation happening now. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure you would uh, noted this too, Jane, you know, happening now than say 10 years ago or 20 years ago it's there there's so many voices really uh excited and enthused and and speaking to their part of the world and uh what what it seems to be most important for them to be to be making a change and this might be the in the area of uh, philanthropy sustainability workplace culture you know creative expression to to bust the taboo and bust the the, the myth and we can the three of us can talk about that more later so just to just to sum up a little bit um, at this stage, uh, a few years ago, I started the Chalice Foundation, which is a nonprofit uh, designed for the purpose of uh, creating a positive menstrual culture, supporting menstrual educators, and uh, and it's about menstrual well-being in in all ways. And um, well, 20, 21 years ago, actually, this month, so Celebration Day for Girls started <laughs> twenty one years ago, and uh, just in um, my local school, because of my background with um, uh, fertility management, uh, the school asked me, would I run a program for mothers and daughters? And this was for girls in year five and six. So, you know, um, 11 and 12 year olds at that point with their mums. So I hadn't worked with children before, but it was too wonderful and fabulous an opportunity <laughs> to not to take up. So I created uh, Celebration Day for Girls. And I have to say it's been running in and for that school since that time. Uh, they at that point made it a curriculum event and it has stayed that. And I would say in that school, um, there's a, there is the culture of, of positive menstrual education. Uh, there's a culture of respect from everybody. Uh, so whether it's the boys or the dads or other kids, parents, teachers, um, and it's, and it's um, 
and it's active rather than passive. Uh, so just to give you a little example, there was some research done uh, a few years ago. This was for uh, the Victorian Women's Trust that resulted in the book about bloody time. And I know Jane's got it on her desk because so, I saw it there. <laughs> um, so some of the research that went into that was uh, conversation groups in schools uh, around Victoria, also other age groups, but for, for this uh, story, just the schools. So they went to, uh, the researchers went to seven schools. There was a real mix of schools. There was inner city, there was regional, there was uh, rural schools, there was private schools, public schools, religious schools, non-religious schools, so a whole mix. And uh, they found in all of these schools bar one, the, the, the overwhelming um, quality was girls were reluctant to talk, even in well-held spaces with experienced facilitators where it was safe to talk. They were uncomfortable speaking about periods with their peers. So they didn't feel safe speaking with their peers. And this, through their written responses, this is because uh, even girls will use knowledge that someone has their period today, even if they have it next week, uh, they would use that knowledge uh, uh, as social capital to tell the boys or tell someone else to tease that so that that girl ends up being teased or bullied about, about having her period. Uh, so there was, there was discomfort. Um, you know, some of the girls were more forthcoming, but largely that was the, that was the flavor of these conversation groups. Um, and girls consequently, you know, hated or disliked their period. They wished there were um, pad packets that, with, that, that you could open that didn't make a sound so that the person in the next cubicle would not know they had their period. Um, and, and similar uh, kind of really distressing um, uh, stories about how they felt about their period. So, I mean, just as an aside, how can we expect girls to have a healthy, positive relationship with their body, if that's their experience in their early days of having a menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it beggars belief that we, that we don't give much more money and much more attention to this issue. So coming back to the story, so in this one school that had been having Celebration Day for Girls, um, and, and because of that, a, you know, healthy conversations and, and a positive approach, um, even if they didn't all understand why, I mean, not all the mums that came really understood the point, but after they had come, they go, oh, okay, I get that. This was for me too, <laughs> you know. So, so it, it, it changed according to the different understandings that people had. So the girls in the group from that school, and they were several years on by the time this, this research conversation group came, they were notably different. They were open. They were comfortable with each other. They obviously supported each other when they had their period. There was one girl who had really uh, a lot of difficulty, a lot of pain with her period. And every time when she was at school with that, uh, she was supported with that. They, the girl, other girls and teachers sometimes, but mostly the girls would help with, you know, rugs and hot water bottles and, you know, some herb tea and really look after her. The girls were also comfortable speaking about periods in front of the boys, which was not evident at all in any of the other uh, schools. It was natural. So if they needed a pad from somebody, they'd ask, it wouldn't really matter who was around. They'd say, oh, has anyone got a pad? Or here you go. Um, and the boys were really nonchalant about it. It wasn't, it was not an issue. They were, they were comfortable. Um, and they were supportive too. Uh, so, you know, this is this, and, and if you think of that culture, so that's just a few years on in a, in a regular school with all the stuff that happens in regular schools. But what does that do for girls' self confidence, their sense of being able to be themselves mm -hmm. in all social situations, their, their capacity to be present? And I dare say also, even when they came into situations with other people who maybe weren't so comfortable with periods, they had really taken on deep in themselves a sense of goodness, a sense of wholesomeness in their own body, in their own cyclic life, so that other people's discomfort 
was far less for that person about it anymore, but it didn't affect their sense of themselves. They, they were able just to put it into a, into a healthy context. So that's a long story from me. <laughs> um, I'll hand over to you, Jane. Thanks. It's beautiful to hear. Something. Well, what great, what great evidence, Jane, you know, of that school. Yeah. The girls growing up with a positive menstrual culture and that playing out in, in the way that they were. Evidence. So that's, I think, is mm -hmm. the most exciting thing that we can change this in one generation. We don't need to, um, this doesn't need to die with everybody. It can be changed right now. So I think that's really inspiring. Mm -hmm. So how I got into, into menstrual education was via my role as a midwife. So when Jane was looking for contraception, I was catching babies <laughs> and um, the other end of that. So um, I was a home birth midwife and uh, the point when the menstrual cycle, because obviously the menstrual cycle has a lot to do with pregnancy, it's the way there, etc. But it's really insane how little of that is part of a midwife's education. It's just kind of like, you know, you ovulate on blah, 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 and then this. So, so very little more to do with it, which is ridiculous because midwives are meant to be able to help women with all of that time in their lives, including contraception and fertility stuff, but they certainly didn't equip us uh, with that information. So it was something that I explored myself, but the pathway that took me to the exploration, um, apart from my own experience of the menstrual cycle, but when I really started paying attention to it was when my two passions met and that was midwifery and shamanism. So that combination of those two unlikely words really just like turned me into me, which was pretty, um, well, a bit of a relief actually, that I could find my own place in all of this. So I was learning about shamanic practices and was being a home birth midwife and I actually went over to um, America to attend a conference that was uh, a birth conference. And I met Janine Pavati Baker, who, uh, who's dead now, but she became my mentor and teacher. And <clears throat> she basically, well, I went to a pre-conference workshop called Shamanic Midwifery. And I thought, oh, I wonder what that is. I really want to know that. I'd already heard about Janine. So this is in um 1989 i think by the time i got there and um so basically what happened was i learned about the cycles and not just the menstrual cycle but the big cycles the earth cycles the lunar cycle the menstrual cycle the life cycle and i learned about the magic and power and magnitude of those cycles and mostly what i learned was how distant our lives are from them and, and what how unfortunate that is and actually perilous. So it's kind of like mm. I got to put everything back together in my own mind. Like I, I learned that um, we, we don't visit nature, we are nature. We're the mm. human pattern of nature. And so I learned about the cycles, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's all the same cycle. Everything has the same cycle, just at different speeds. And the menstrual cycle, what I learned mostly about that is the, the magic of it, the actual sort of opportunities of it. Like there is so much uh, personal growth, for want of a better word. Janine would never use that word. She said, you don't want to have growths all over you. Don't say personal growth. <laughs> but the, the um, personal development, that uh, any, the, there is more personal development opportunities in the menstrual cycle than anywhere else in, in a woman's mm -hmm. life. And a man's probably if he's paying attention. So um, learning about the power of that and the opportunity of all of the cycles was really what put it together for me in terms of making sense of everything. And um, in terms of actually teaching menstrual education, I started doing that when um, about 30 years ago, 
to basically help women understand what was going on. And, and back then we were learning together as well. You know, there weren't very many books written. There were no books written about Southern Hemisphere cycles. It was all Northern Hemisphere stuff and very few things written about the menstrual cycle. Jane's book, um, A Blessing Not a Curse, was one of the first ones. And our friend and colleague, Lara Owen, her book, uh, Her Blood is Gold, was, I think, the first. Oh, no, actually, there were some other ones before that that were quite academic and archaeological and, and really awesome books. But in the sort of like the modern world, I think Lara's was the first one, um, Her Blood is Gold. And so I think the first time I went to school to teach menstrual cycle awareness was not really under that guise. So it was... It was as a result of this is my youngest, who was in uh, primary school then at about, um, I don't know, what was it, maybe like 10 or something, and they were having a history lesson and their assignment was find out when women got the vote. And I <laughs> said to him, wrong question. Why the fuck didn't women have the vote in the first place? And so this was really um, an opening for me into the school. It was a Steiner school, so a little bit more open to alternative things than state schools and other um, alternate schools are as well, in my experience. But I got the opportunity to actually speak to the children in, um, like in their last years of primary school, so, so like fourth, fifth and sixth class, about the Her Story, which is something that I've written that is basically like a combination of everything written about the story of how the patriarchy affects the feminine. And um, that was the answer to why didn't women have the vote in the first place? Because that yes. is very well wrapped into the patriarchal perspective of women and mm -hmm. the feminine and why none of us knew anything about the menstrual cycle, let alone birth and menopause, why the women's mysteries as they're known, the blood mysteries, why they had been buried really, and only really passed on from mother to daughter to daughter to daughter over the years, because it was it was not seen as important, like what you've encountered, Adriana, in your in your conversations with people. It's like you know what you know. It's been so hidden for so long that it was assumed that it was unimportant, but far from the case. That's certainly not the situation. So. Now my work is um, teaching this kind of thing all the time and teaching teachers how to teach this stuff and teaching mothers and daughters and uh, taking um, midwifing and facilitating women through this whole reclamation of all of this stuff. I feel like like exhaling <laughs> after you both <laughs> 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 journeys um yeah yeah it's very beautiful i um i guess what i feel like asking is also have you encountered so i do want to to hear a bit about the the wins the the beautiful uh, things that you have witnessed happening for for women and people um and maybe you can tell a few stories because i'd love to hear that um hmm. But also I'd love to hear if there have been moments of difficulty, like because it is a hard topic. I mean, especially back then when you started, both of you started, I imagine, I don't know if all the time, I can see that now um, you're both really established in your careers and people come to you. So people know about you, people come to you. But I want, I don't imagine it was like that all the time. And I, I, I wonder also if you, if you had moments of despair or, or like, oh, what am I doing? Like, should I, is this too hard or not? Or maybe you didn't have that, but I'd love to hear um, a little bit of both um, aspects of it. If you have uh, maybe some stories to share, maybe we can start with the wins, <laughs> maybe some, some beautiful mm -hmm. stories to share. I don't know. Uh, thanks, Jane. I don't know what you mean by wins, Adriana. Can you unpack that briefly for me? Yeah, that's that's a good um, that's a good question. I mean, it's whatever you 
if you have stories that you feel like, for example, you just shared one, right? You just shared that story about that school. So that's, that's a, you could mm -hmm. see culture changing just there. So you ah, could see okay. that, um, uh, there were a lot of schools that that didn't happen, but also there was that school mm. that that happened and that inspires you and, and keeps you going and keeps you going like, wow, you know, I, that, that woman changed her life or that, mm. that girl changed her life. And so maybe you have some Great. other stories or some things that you could share. <laughs> I have, I have encyclopedias of stories <laughs> as I'm sure Jane does too. Mm. Um, Thanks for that. I thought that was kind of what you meant, but you know, I just needed needed to be really clear. Uh, one, one that comes to mind for me is uh, this is the story of a uh, a woman who came and trained with us for to be to be able to run Celebration Day for Girls, and she was a woman who, you know, had been doing some work for quite some years on her cycle. She she was quite comfortable. Uh, looking after herself and knew when her vulnerabilities were and, and you know, um, uh, managed her life in that, with that uh, thread. So she was, and she also taught yoga, so she, she was really quite comfortable with her own cycle. What she realised through our training is I had really got a deeper understanding of what menstrual shame was or the menstrual taboo, you know, similar, similar parts of the same um, phenomena um, and she realized that while she personally didn't feel she was carrying shame that we do culturally you know culturally it's it's the norm it's how we function and and the manifestation in her life was that she comfortable as she was with her own cycle she wouldn't she didn't talk about it publicly unless it particularly came up and, and, and you know, it, it came up from other people or she went to a course and, and then it was a, a subject. So she decided to push that envelope a bit. So she decided to be the one to bring it up in different situations, in, whether it's in work situations or, or whatever, or if people were said, well, what, are you, what have you been doing? And she would talk about it uh, rather than, I'm just gonna keep that tucked away. And so she contacted me one day, having done this for a while, and she said, it's been really amazing to do um, and quite a revelation. And what she found is in most instances when she brought it up, and I dare say she's a sensitive person, so she wasn't standing on a, 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 um, a city square, you know, talking about the blood clots going down the shower, <laughs> um, whatever, whatever way. I mean, she had some, some social skills. So she would bring, you know, she would bring it into, uh, into situations. And uh, she found almost without exception that it opened a doorway and people were very happy to speak and very curious about what she'd been doing. And uh, it was like, and what she really felt is that a lot of people are probably in that situation. That, but they're just not getting the modeling of someone comfortable to broach the subject, to open that door. Um, and so she, through that, she really saw the power of this work that we, that we do and uh, the value of, uh, of normalizing and putting it out there and inviting hearing about people's experiences and um, you know, in, in inviting them to sort of meet their inner world with with the, the larger world you know and and the power of that for everybody to be able to be fully present in the world mm. you know as your whole self mm. um so so that was a you know powerful for her but i think also her role in the world uh probably really you know went up several notches uh mm -hmm. because of that mm. thank you it's beautiful yeah hearing it so um, it's the new moon right now. <laughs> Just Yay. paying attention. So, oh, welcome to the new moon. So because I know part of the wisdom of the cycles is that whatever happens at the beginning of something sets the energy for what unfolds. So to be sitting here with you two at this new moon and knowing that this is the seed that will grow this lunar cycle, I'm very glad. Mm. So... The winds that I would um, speak of here are many, actually. I think so much has changed be since Jane and I got into the B 
business of blood or whatever you might like to call it. I, I do like saying things like that because I, I am a little bit of a, you know, stirrer and, and I probably wouldn't have the social skills that Jane's saying that woman <laughs> had of, of not talking about blood clots going down showers and stuff. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a bit more forthcoming with the shockingness. But what I have actually seen, as many of us have, are the improvements for women now, like especially mm. teenage and girls and young, young adults, like with period undies mm. and menstrual mm. cups, you know, like genius. Jane and I will remember the first apparatus, I think is probably the best word to use for what we were given when we started <laughs> bleeding. You know, they were called surfboards and, and I had one that it had sort of like a, a like a elastic belt that went around your hips with clips coming at the back and the front to, to thread through the long bit. Like when they invented sticky things on the bottom of pads, it was like a revolution. But now period undies, you know, like that's really mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. and, and the menstrual cups. And I think one of the best things about that those kinds of menstrual uh, products um, are that the girls and the women see the blood, you mm. know, like prior to like, well, for goodness sake, there's even tampons that have applicators so that you don't even have to put your finger in your vagina. Like the messages behind all the menstrual products are really like disgusting that blood is disgusting mm. and your body is disgusting. Mm. Like they're scented and all that kind of thing. Anyway. So, the wins are the, mm. the ways that clever people have created for women and girls to manage their blood. Mm. And uh, there's so many books now and courses and groups mm. and, and um, also uh, preparation for girls for menstruation, like each of us are doing. That's new, you know, like, and not very common, but it's becoming a thing. Mm. And that there's now like in Victoria, I think was the first state for pads and tampons to be in the high school toilets, like mm. epic. Mm. Sounds like minor, but it's not minor because we know there's a terrible scenario called period poverty where, where families and girls don't have money to buy the stuff. So they're really, you know, limited in what they can do and can't do and whatnot. So seeing that kind of thing happening is epic. Mm. And, um, also, what I think the wins are with this information or this knowledge is body autonomy or body awareness first. You know, women are learning, like Jane outlined when she first figured it all out, that they feel different every day and that that's not actually a problem. You know, <laughs> that's the way we are. That's the way of cycles and that we are cyclical beings. So I feel like the uh, menstrual education and menstrual awareness that we've all been part of is really helping women step further into um, autonomy mm. and also kind of um, highlighting that this this fight we've been having for equality with men mm. is not the right tack you know it's like we're, mm. n we're we're not the same because equality with with between the sexes has has kind of meant women are equal to men so long as they can do what they do well like you know that's not actually what's going on mm -hmm. and um, women are so different to men mm -hmm. and the menstrual cycle runs our life for you know half of our life 40 years or so 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 helping women to understand and reclaim this is mm -hmm. really helping both sexes to understand the difference between us and and not like difference in a bad way, but difference in, well, what can we magic we can do when we come together and what women can bring to mm. um, heterosexual relationships in terms of a rhythm, you know, that um, is happening, whether we pay attention to it or not. So I think oh, another another um, really positive story in my local community, uh, I'm not so involved in it now because I'm traveling Well, I'm not traveling at the moment. No one's traveling at the moment, but <laughs> Um, doing so many things, these the local sort of spiritual community that used to gather at Beltane, which in the Southern Hemisphere is October 31, we would have a, a, a camp where all the families would come together and we would honour, we would have a ceremony where we would honour the girls whose blood had come that year or girls who hadn't had a ceremony already and wanted to come and be part of it. 
and the boys who turned 13 that year. So it was their puberty right with the men mm. and the welcome to womanhood for the girls. And what we saw happen over, I think it was about a decade that I was involved in this process. What we saw happen was the little girls who were coming to the welcome to womanhood ceremonies for the big girls and with their mums, they got to see this whole other situation going on when periods started. Like, I don't think they would have even known it was a thing, but this was like part of their, our annual life together, this community, we would gather to honor and celebrate these girls entering womanhood. And so the little ones grew up year after year, watching these, the big girls have their ceremony. And they were so excited, like, when will it be my turn? Oh, they would speak to each other. Let's hope we get ours in the same year so we can do our ceremony together. It was like, again, changed in one generation, like from their mothers who were like, you know, fully into the menstrual shame situation that we're all in, but their, their daughters were, 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 had totally changed the, the uh, family um, picture yeah. on on menstruation and that that felt so good to me that felt so mm -hmm. powerful because i knew as a midwife that how we experience our menarch our first period impacts how we give birth so i've been watching this experiment mm -hmm. and i've had the honor to um have been part of some girls um menarch rite of passage and be around for their birth and I've even had the experience of being the midwife at their birth and being the priestess mm -hmm. at their menarch ceremony and then available to them, you know, later for contraception and birth and stuff. So I've watched mm -hmm. this go through and it's so different and such a win and, and mm -hmm. it'll change, it's changed their trajectories. And the other thing that I think is really important, which is what I encourage mothers to do is to, to openly menstruate with their little children. You know, like they don't get to go to the toilet without them anyway. So they'd have to be doing some pl pretty clever gymnastics to be hiding what they're doing. Mm. So I think it's like this window of time, especially with the boys mm. that mums have to normalize the menstrual cycle because the boys will not follow their mums to the toilet forever and they will stop asking what's going on as well. So mm. it's there's the opportunity. And, mm. and if we can take that opportunity and realize what we're doing is changing the future, for the friends that that boy will have, the girlfriends and the partners. If the mum raises her children in a positive menstrual culture in the house, then that changes the next lot. So lots of wins, but so slow. Mm. And you know, I'm a bit speedy, right? So it's a bit boring and annoying when it goes so slow, mm. but um, you know, we have hung in there and we've done some amazing things and perhaps we'll talk about it, but one of the gigantic wins that we had, which was uh, the work of Jane and me and Catherine Cunningham, another menstrual educator and Lara Owen, who I mentioned al already in combination with the Victorian Women's Trust. What, um, well, the four of us got together and we called ourselves, we had this special club. We called ourselves, rightfully so, Aries Moon, because we all had Aries Moon. So we knew what we were up for, like, look out, kapow. <laughs> and what we as menstrual educators had seen over the decades mm. was actually how bad it is out there at the front line for women with their bodies mm. and the menstrual cycle mm. and, and everywhere. And so we, we decided we have to prove it. Mm. We have to gather the data. We've got to do the research to find out, well, not find out, we already knew, but to get on paper and prove to people who, who need that kind of information, which is fair enough, just how bad it is. So maybe you're gonna go into the challenges next and we can talk about that then. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to, um, yeah, we can totally go into that. I was, both of you shared so much that I was like, oh, I got excited lots of different times that I was like, I wanna say something, but it's, I'm like, oh, we could have this, Maybe we'll have another one of these conversations. But <laughs> one thing that came to me is that working with development, because after studying, I've been really into the adult development world and, you know, learning how um, a child, a teenager is in really the, the kind of like the conformist 
developmental stage. So basically like fitting in with their peers is the most important thing, it's so important. So um, hearing this, this journey, Jane, about um, you know, using the little ones with a new culture. So what they wanted to fit into was different. Mm -hmm. And because mm -hmm. actually it's not necessarily what their parents tell, because I see that the parents can be really attuned, but if the peers ridicule and the, mm -hmm. the culture of the school is still a ridiculing culture, it's still at that time fitting in with the, with the friends is really what's shaping them at that age. So I, I was really, um, yeah, I was really excited about that because I can see how in that forming time, how that culture is the same that you said, Jane Bennett, about the school in which you created a culture and that culture shaped the girls in a completely different way and the boys and everybody that was seeing that. And um, it reminds me, there's a couple of things. One is, and that might tie into the negative, the negative bits that we, we can go into a little bit and and I feel it's important to touch on the negative bits because it it's important to contextualize. You know, it's 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 a lot of like if I if I'm not hanging out with the two of you, if I'm not hanging out with my friends that have studied this on purpose, they have made a point of trying to change that for some reason. A lot of women because of pregnancy, a lot of women because of some fertility problem, or because they came across a book or whatever it is that was happening in their lives. If they don't do that, all my female friends that haven't searched, for them, it's it's not a thing. like Or it's a negative thing. It's either a, a very negative thing in their lives that they wish they didn't have, or it's a nothing, which is still a negative thing because they still run by it. It still happens, but they they... It's a nothing. So that, that takes me to another part of my work, which is... Um, like developmentally, how we've moved away um, from our bodies, like rightly, um, it's part of, suppose it's part of the evolution of consciousness, but we forgot to include the, the <laughs> earlier sides, which is not even earlier. I mean, they're, they're earlier because they're necessary. They're the body, but we kind of disconnected ourselves from the body. So we developed the mental developmental stage and we're like, we, we think, of the concept of what it is to be a woman. So what it is to be a woman became a concept. What the world tells me I am, I believe because I live in my head. I live in the world of thought and I live completely disconnected from my body. So that is a bit of a tricky space because it's tricky even to talk about, but it, I noticed that because when I talk to some friends that I know they have been so divorced from their bodies, if I talk to them about certain things, that is just my word against their word because they don't feel it. They have become mm -hmm. numb. So it's not, they don't, um, they don't perceive any truth in, in, in that. And it can become, it can be even threatening. So for some women, what I have found also is that in, in the past, um, years, I have had this conversation with women that have been initiated, and that's really easy and beautiful when we support each other and we celebrate each other. And all. Then I have had this conversation with women that have never heard about it, and some women feel challenged about that notion because they, they think they have been doing women wrong, and that's the last thing that I want is to challenge because, fuck, life is hard already trying to having a cycle and pretending that you don't have one because all the systems that you're in don't acknowledge that. So then I come and I say that having a cycle means that, you know, how you're gonna express yourself is different, how you're gonna, so many things are gonna be different, you know, in your whole trajectory of a month that some women feel challenged by that notion and they feel really defensive. And I understand it, like I, I I totally, um, so there's that. And I felt that the men, because they don't, because for a man, it can never be experiential. It's never their experience. And, but also they don't feel threatened by it necessarily. Uh, it, it has been easier for me to talk to some, if I'm talking to some very open-minded men, it's really easy for them to go like, oh my God, how did I miss this? I can't believe it. It's just because I don't have, you know, they, they were really, 
I didn't experience men feeling so challenged by it as I experienced women, as if I'm, as if I'm making them wrong, which, which is not, not at all true. But it is just voicing the fact that being a part of a culture and being shaped by culture, which we all are uh, to a certain extent, and unplugging from culture is a hard thing. And, and um, Jane, when you said about shame, in the past year and a half, I've been really exploring, even more so, two years, exploring trauma and the concept of trauma that has brought by the work of people like Gabo Mate, but also um, Thomas Hubel, which brings collective trauma. And I had a session with Thomas Hubel in a platform that is, it's called the, the, the Rebel Wisdom Platform. So it's a, I'll, I'll, I'll put the link, I'll send you guys, but it's a, it, it was, um, he was invited to the rebel wisdom community to do to speak to us and in that space i noticed that i so i started bleeding on the day that the the interview was going to be held and as soon as i had my period on the day of that interview because i have that relationship with my with my blood or my menstrual cycle i was like ah oh, what does that mean because i was going to go to that interview on that in that space so I went, it was 50 people online, was an online space and Thomas Hubel came and he um, had asked people to, to um, you know, people that wanted to work with him on trauma. And I hadn't, I didn't want to work in public with him on trauma, but um, there was a conversation on the hidden collective trauma and on the chat, I, I posted something on the chat and I said, what about the menstrual cycle? Is that hidden trauma? You know, is that something like that we should talk about? So I had a lot of comments on my thread and the, the facilitator of the call said, maybe would you like to work with Thomas Hubel on this? And I was like, oh, there we go, you know. So <laughs> I was on that call and as soon as Thomas um, was present to me on the call, he was so present and he, um, and I, I just burst into tears. I just started crying and I cried, I sobbed and I sobbed <laughs> the pain. And I think some people interpreted that wrongly. You know, it's not that I'm ashamed of my menstrual cycle, but I carry the trauma is in my cells. I mean, it's not anywhere else. I'm in constant relationship with what is to be initiated in a different way and being powered. And also the uphill battle that is constant of living in a world that if I'm not articulate enough, if I don't express myself in a certain way, whatever, then it's, it's not good enough. It's not intelligent enough. It's not whatever enough. And I'm tired of it. It's like, it's not true. That's not true. But this mismatch of me, and I know that other women feel that, like, oh, I've been initiated. I know how this is. I know this intelligence in me. And yet I keep having to excuse myself. Oh, I'm sorry, I have my period. So I'm not articulate enough or whatever. And I'm like, no, it's not, I'm sorry. I'm more connected today. I'm more in tune today, but maybe my words will, won't come out the way that you think is mm. articulate or whatever it is. So basically I cried, it was like a 10 minute session. And I, and full disclosure, I bled. My menstruation uh, lasted 15 days um, after mm. that session. And it felt to me, you know, whatever. Some people might think that's a crazy talk, whatever people think, but it felt to me some collective processing of trauma was happening right there because mm. I really went into a deep space mm. of like the collective pain of this. I was just like, it's being massive. And um, I was mm. just holding the pain of my sisters that are not even awake to that at all and might never be. Mm. So, um, so anyway, so this is a segue into whatever you want to share into... Um, yeah, into, into this. And I just want to share one last thing about this is that I gave, when I was teaching this work um, that inspired by both of you, one thing that I decided to do was teach to people that didn't want to didn't wanna learn this. So basically I taught, I taught people that came to me and they came and it was beautiful. And then I offered about 10 free workshops to people that didn't have 
any interest in this. So I went to an advertising agency. I went to a magazine. I went to uh, a business. Um, I spoke to different uh, in different contexts, always in the guise of female leadership. And it was like it was a completely different experience. Like it was. Um, and after a while, I just I stopped because I ran out of juice. I was like, why am I doing this? You know, it's kind of like. Um, but having said that, because like I would never see these women after I, I didn't know what happened. I didn't know if I sparked them in any way. I'm, I would see the resistance um, when I introduced the topic. Um, but to tie the negative with the positive, um, a few years later, I, I received an email of two women that were the owners of a, of a startup. And they said to me, you know, after your workshop, I never heard of them again. And then like a few years later, they wrote to me and they said, it changed everything for us. We, we had babies in the meantime. We, we had no idea what you're talking about. And it was completely disconnected from our experience. But after we had children and we started seeing what happens, we wanted to use this in our business. And we don't even know how to do this because how can we implement this in our business? The business run by women, but still, it's still not, it doesn't have rhythm because the world doesn't see the rhythm is necessary. So it's still, even though it's a win, in a way, I, I'm always confronted by the truth of how it's not received by other places. And it's really hard to even show up in this free, in this free way in the world. So yeah, I'd love to hear both of you, whoever feels called um, to, to share. Mm. 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 Uh, I'm hearing all that you're saying, Adriana, and, you know, many scenarios are coming to my mind. I guess, you know, how I think through, excuse me, <coughs> you know, there, there is a lot of resistance in the world and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of a sense of, well, what are you talking about? I remember when I was first writing, uh, Jane mentioned A Blessing Not a Curse, which was published in 2002, and a family member, you know, was I was talking about what I was doing, or she asked, and she said, what is there to say? Well, you know, how could you possibly fill a book? <laughs> now, for you two, it's like, well, you know, books and books and books. <laughs> but, um, you know, that was, that was where it was for her and, and for many, many people. Um, I guess for me, my nature is such that I, you know, if there is interest, is if there is a door opening, if there is somebody wanting to have a conversation or wanting to do some training or wanting to come to a workshop or wanting me to write something or wanting me to come and have a conversation like with you, you know, that's an open door. And I love that. And I love going through that and offering what I can. You know, I know uh, there are many, many places where, you know, there isn't particular interest that 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 that, that hasn't woken up. Um, and like you, I mean, I have had times in my life where I've sort of tried to put it out more publicly and found that that's a hard slog, you know, and, and it just often is a vacuum, like there's nothing that comes back. Uh, whether... Uh, but similar, similar to what the experience you just talked about, I, I also think sometimes the first time someone bumps into this totally different understanding of uh, the menstrual cycle and the cycling body, um, it might be just a few words that just plants a seed which starts a process. So we never know where our words, where our work lands and the work that that does. And, and I'm sure similar to that uh, for you, Adriana, and certainly for you, Jane, um, you know, you will hear things after years that people tell you, you know, of what changed for them and how their life changed. And of course, for everyone who does, there are many who don't. There are many people who don't tell us what's, what's happened for them. So I guess, uh, you know, when I've had times of, you know, doors shut <laughs> um, and, and, you know, the blank looks, I feel what, what I've tried, where I've tried to focus is where there are openings and there seriously are plenty of those. Um, and there's more energy flowing in those situations, which of course is much more pleasurable uh, for me. And, and I often, you know, I often say to my facilitators, because sometimes 
for the women that I've trained to run Celebration Day for Girls, uh, you know, some, you know, everyone has to work hard to get their groups together. And some find that really hard and, and find it hard when it's, when, when they can't get a group together. I mean, pandemics, you know, aside. Um, and one of the things I say, uh, and of course, you know, I really acknowledge the disappointment in that and, and the difficulty in that. And sometimes, especially if they're living in a, either a country or an area where it's completely foreign, where there's no conversation, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's hard work getting that started. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I do say is every conversation you have, even if it's not leading to a workshop and not leading to what you really want to do that's going to give you a lot of joy, um, every single conversation is about social change. And we're at the pointy end of this very, very positive, powerful, empowering, um, life-changing, uh, you, know, you know, changing society in very profound ways, gender equity and so on. Um, every conversation is making a difference. So it's where we come from, it's our state, it's the modeling we do, our own comfort in having those conversations and even our authenticity about where we're not comfortable mm -hmm. uh, and being able to be really present in that. That is, to me, that's the catalyst. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think it's so important to be able to be present with that. And I just want to sort of give another little example. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the menstrual cycle um, <clears throat> is part of life that you know, we can ignore to a large extent, and particularly people who, women who don't have, you know, diffi particularly difficult periods, it, it, it can be handled in a minimal, okay, get the pads out or, or, or whatever, or even switched off with, um, uh, with hormones. Um, but similar to the breath, I mean, the breath defines our life from first breath to last breath. We can go through and except when we've got a cold or we're holding our breath underwater or a few instances where we pay attention to the breath, we can go through life without paying much attention. It's going to happen, you know, naturally anyway. Um, maybe the periods do require a bit more attention than that, but, but basically that can be it. Hmm. However, if we think about the breath and for those people who have uh, attended a yoga class or a meditation group or some other practice where they're paying attention to how the breath feels. Mm -hmm. And the breath is a cycle too. So the in-breath and the out-breath and it has all those qualities of the large cosmic cycles that you're talking about, Jane. It's one cycle. So for all of those people who've spent any time paying attention to the breath, how the in-breath feels, the pause between the in-breath and the out-breath, the very different sensations and feeling of the out-breath and that pause between the out-breath and the in-breath. I remember hearing about a, 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 an American author who spent two years in a uh, forest monastery in Thailand and his task for two years was to say something new about the breath every day. <clears throat> you know, it's mind-blowing, isn't it? But if you have spent time with the breath, and we can certainly imagine that with the menstrual cycle, can't we? That you could say every single day of your whole life that you have a period, you would have something new to say about that experience. So uh, while it's not necessary to have that attention, to put that awareness into it, to live, to be alive on this planet, the richness uh, and the value of that applying that awareness of noticing of valuing our own experience how is this for me how can i help myself how can i take care of myself on these challenging days what what do i need to do in my life all those sort of questions i mean it's amazing to there's so many great books around now uh there's great courses uh you know we can we can learn collectively and ultimately it's that valuing and dignifying and attention to our own experience that is ultimately our teacher. Um, so I don't know quite how I got onto this, but anyway, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So um, how, 
hard has it been? What have the challenges been? Well, I think um, it's kind of easy now, but it hasn't been. It's it's the it's an accepted um, situation to prepare girls for for their men arc. I mean, not everybody's doing it, but women are waking up and thinking, oh, I don't want what happened to me to happen to my daughter. And they're doing the inner work and welcoming their daughters to womanhood in an empowering way. So like that's new. Mm -hmm. Like there would have been isolated situations like that in the past, but not a not a movement. It was um, more what you were saying, Adriana, you know, that just this collective amnesia about it. So it's been hard to be, have been at it for so long, but uh, good now. But it hasn't been, in terms of, for me personally, nothing is harder than being a home birth midwife. So it's much easier than that. Because in the home birth midwifery world, you know, that's where the witch hunt and witch burnings mm. are still happening. Mm. And that's actually like, it's not a separate story because it's all tied into the same story. And um it's all about the collective pain trauma and um amnesia that we're in this situation and also i think like i i kind of double clicked on all the how does this happen why is this keep on happening like as a midwife back when i was doing my midwifery training when i was 25 and i saw all this terrible stuff going on in the maternity, cutting edge maternity world, you know, maternity hospital, best place you could go. And as mm. I say so often, what I saw was institutionalized acts of abuse and violence being carried out mm. on mothers and babies masquerading as safety. And I just thought, oh, well, they, they mm. won't come back. They won't come back, but they came back. Mm. And I, that was the first thing that really got me is I, I thought that the women would wake up when people were being gross to them and and mm. choose something different but i then learned about what a rite of passage is and this is significant for this conversation because this is what our menarch is our first period is mm. a rite of passage and a rite of passage is not some new uh, new thing it's the an anthropologically studied traditional um cultural process that happens at various times in people's lives. It's more obvious for women because it's the blood mysteries, it's menarche, mm. birth, childbirth and mm. menopause. But for men, it's the same sorts of ages. So puberty and then adulthood and then, you know, wise man time. But the thing about this that I learned is that whatever, ha well, I've learned that our culture has forgotten that rites of passage are a thing. But the thing is that whatever happens, if you forget to honour the rite of passage, whatever happens is the rite of passage. And what a rite of passage does, so think about menarch here, first period. What a rite of passage does is teaches the person going through the rite, so the girl, how, by what happens, what doesn't happen, what's said and not said and whatever's going on in her world at that time. It teaches her on a subliminal level, which means she doesn't even know she's being taught how her culture values the next stage she's going into woman and therefore how to behave to be accepted by the culture. So, so the problem is, or the actual solution is <laughs> the thing we can work with is that rites of passage create and reinforce culture and the culture that they create on the inside is through the mindset, the beliefs, attitudes, and fears that the experience creates mm -hmm. and then they maintain and reinforce culture on the outside because everybody conforms to that mm -hmm. so you know you don't have to ask too many women what their experiences of menarch were and what that taught them about they, about being a woman to realize that menstrual shame is actually the pandemic that's been going on for ever mm -hmm. and that we are all also carrying what we call our red thread or mother line stories our generational trauma and like you know actually not that long ago 300 years which is not that many generations actually mm. was the end, end of the witch burnings in the dark ages mm. of uh, european culture where people were being burned at the stake because they were women 
mm-hmm. and everything to do with a woman's body was reviled. All the major religious texts have in their beginning documents that a, a woman who bleeds is impure and, um, and she does all kinds of things like um, ruin crops and, and sour wine and, you know, all that sort of bullshit. And that that's the basis of our culture. That's the that's the foundations, those beliefs. So mm-hmm. so our the women that, that we meet, as you mentioned, Adriana, who are either like, oh whatever or angry, like I meet a lot of women who learn this information and then get really pissed off, like, why didn't they tell me this? Mm-hmm. How come I didn't know this? What have I been wasting? Mm-hmm. And especially this happens at menopause and the work I do with women with menopause. It's so sad when, mm-hmm. when they wake up to it and think, oh, my God, I've lost all that time when I could have been really mm-hmm. working with my blood and working with the cycle and the development it offers me. So basically the thing about a rite of passage is it's the time when we get brainwashed, mm-hmm. brainwashed by whatever is the underpinning Mm-hmm. Um, beliefs and attitudes and fears that choreograph our our um, rite of passage into the next phase. So there's clues there as well as um, reasons why. So, you know, the basic clue is if we bring consciousness to our welcoming of our daughters to their menarche and our sons to their puberty, mm-hmm. then their adult lives are going to be so different. They're going to be stepping into mm-hmm. a place of power rather than somewhere to hide or mm. feel shame or all of that. So I think the other thing that's been hard and disheartening is that, you know, it's different now, but not everywhere. Like we're in a bit of a bubble, to be fair, but actually no one really cares, you know, including women. And that's that's a tragedy. Mm. And um, And also to really see as we, we, people like Jane and me and Adriana, you doing the work with women about this, we know the stories and they're so sad and so mm. common and, you know, but doing the menstrual research, menstrual and menopause research that the Waratah Project um, was all about just showed us, mm. like in numbers, how fucked it is. You know, like mm. the situation of menstrual shame and menstrual trauma is... Like, I actually think that that is the, the underlying negative force that's impacting everything, menstrual shame. So the challenge is how bad that is, how prevalent that is, how many people are just, it's just what they know, but they don't even know that they know that. So it might feel easy now in the bubble because the bubble's getting bigger, but in the big wide world, it's, you know, there's still women dying in menstrual huts because they're banished there from when they're bleeding there's still girls who can't go to school because they don't have pads or whatever Mm -hmm. and there's still all kinds of really twisted shit around bleeding so Mm -hmm. we have lots of work to do it's easier than it has been and absolutely not without its challenges Mm -hmm. do you have any any fact any Mm -hmm. any number I, I, i imagine you have lots but from the Warata research that you, both you, James, were involved in, Lara, and is there anything that you can name or any easy, um, not too long um, bit of research that could give us an idea? I'm sure, Jane, you've got them off the I, top I, of your head. Otherwise, I've well, got Well, I have a open. few. <laughs> I've got the page open. Okay. Hmm. Well, you, you keep your eye on that, Jane. I'll, yep. uh, a few will jump out at me. So one of one of the really interesting um, and devastating stats was uh, because we did um, online online research as well as the in person conversations that I mentioned, and we had uh, nearly three and a half thousand responses, and this was from girls from twelve uh, all the way through to women in their eighties. Uh, and mostly in the middle, <laughs> mostly in the middle. So of the, of the girls, so 12 to 18 year olds, uh, their responses were such that 70%, so this is seven out of 10 of those girls, either hated everything about their period or it's good and bad, but mostly, mostly it's horrible. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I think as a statistic, as a society, Mm. We just need to pause and contemplate what does that mean? Mm. It's not 
this little tucked away part of our life, much as, much as the menstrual taboo would like it to be, it actually informs mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a tiny percent, it was 1% up the other end who liked everything about their period. Mm -hmm. But seven out of 10 um, uh, felt, you know, were really negatively, would, would had a negative attitude. They, and it didn't say they may or may not have had difficult symptoms, but in my experience of this research is there's not an exact match between someone who has a lot of pain and a negative uh, attitude toward their period. It's not always the same thing. And you do, we do, Jane would know of women who have had uh, possibly through endometriosis or just then this meant not just, but dysmenorrhea, you know, really difficult, painful or, or very heavy bleeding or whatever, who also have a positive exploratory attitude. And vice versa, sometimes women who don't have much in the way of symptoms, but really hate the whole experience of, of bleeding and having, having periods. Um, so I think we just, you know, we, we just need to really pause and consider that. We also know that <clears throat> um, it's up in the, up in the 80s uh, percentage of girls and women who feel impacted by their period. By, by their menstrual cycle and particularly the, the menstruation. And 26%, and this is through a number of uh, different research, so it seems fairly consistent, uh, you know, have to take time off from work or school uh, mm -hmm. because of their period. So their experience is strong enough and difficult enough that they can't do that. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a lot of in-between of impediment. So when we look at that, and it's not just this happens once every 10 years, this is happening regularly. For most people, it will be happening every month if they have these days. So, uh, and, and if we match that with the extent to which um, <clears throat> the, the, the paucity of funding for understanding uh, menstrual, menstrual problems, menstrual ill health, or where there's uh, what they call comorbidities and, and, and problems. Uh, an, an, an example is that in Australia, uh, there's a roughly the same number of people who have diabetes mm. uh, to those who have endometriosis. Uh, there is virtually no funding for endometriosis relatively, oh. and there's hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that go in every year into diabetes, into research, into therapy, into uh, public, uh, public, public health education. So I, th I think, you know, we just need to look at a few things like that to just see how starkly clear this situation is. Uh, one more example I'll give you um, is that uh, I, I was speaking to a doctor who was a mum at a, at a rite of passage um, retreat with her daughter a couple of years ago, and she was a doctor. And she said when she was at medical school, and she's what, in her late 30s now, so she, when she was a, uh, a medical student, all they learned about the menstrual cycle is that ovulation happens on day 14, mm -hmm. which, as we know, sometimes is true, but is actually way off the mark if you're gonna if you're gonna actually learn something. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and then the, she only knew there was something off with that when she was in her late twenties, and she and her husband were trying to conceive, and day 14 wasn't working. So then she started doing some study, and she had the light bulb moment that we've all had. Uh, and went, oh my God, there is so much more to this. There is so much more. And she's become, a, if she can ever get someone to sit still, and, and she does this often, you know, she'll do a whole education session and give them a long, a long consult uh, to do that. So she's very keen as a doctor to offer that. I was speaking to a young woman, medical student recently, um, and I was asking her, you know, is it, is it different? And she said, no, mm. not where she's where she's studying it is not different and she is seeing how um mm. invisible the so much of what is is the case for women and and particularly the menstrual cycle is in medical training still in 2021 mm. well, likewise like with birth you know like most doctors in their training never see a normal birth mm. you know mm. and and another um statistic from the Waratah project in the book published in the book about bloody time and available for purchase from the Victorian Women's Trust 
And anybody who's a menstrual educator or interested in this would love this book. It's got everything you need to know, including an awesome section written by Jane mm. about how the menstrual cycle works, you mm. know, like completely this, then this, then this. But one of the other, like, terrible statistics was that 34% of women, so that's like a third, right, either had no idea what was happening or were very uncertain when their period started. Like, you know, there were quotes that I thought I was going to, I thought I was dying. Like, that is a tragedy. And in terms of an initiation into um, the next phase of your life, into womanhood, to think that you're you're about to die like that has a very bad effect and mm -hmm. and such a um, an example of what isn't happening you know mm -hmm. like if if that many women start their periods not knowing what it is then that's actually a, an information gap that is easy to fill but mm -hmm. a tragedy that it's even happening in the first place and in terms of that 70 percent of the girls who disliked or hated everything or nearly everything like we know where that's headed like menstrual pathology because if you reject your menstrual cycle don't worry she'll do whatever she can to get your attention so that you do pay attention mm. it's known as and only recently like in the um just before the turn of the century uh that the medical profession realized decided and proclaimed that the menstrual cycle ought to be known uh, and will be from then on known as the woman's fifth vital sign, that it's, mm. the, it's a way to look at a woman to, to, to see how well or not she is. So mm. like, it's, it's a tragedy really. And um, the other thing I just wanted to say, I can't remember what it was, but um, it was to do with the birth and uh, the research, oh, I can't remember. There's so many things that, mm. so many things to remember and I can't remember everything. Mm. <laughs> no, but Are you thinking of Sharon Maloney's research, Jane? Yes, yes, mm. yes. Okay, you go. You go, you go. Yeah, so Sharon Maloney wrote this um, amazing, so she's a Queensland health worker. She mm. did a PhD on the effects of menstrual shame on childbirth. You know, yeah. it's it's really bad and sad because like birth is something that um, unfolds according to whatever mindset you've got. Mm. And um, if you don't go into birth knowing how amazing your body is mm. and what a miracle worker you are mm. and how you have to listen to your body and respond in the way that she tells you to, to facilitate whatever's going on, mm -hmm. then birth will teach you. And, and so that statistic of 70%, you know, that's what ends up as being in birth intervention and, and all kinds of trauma and stuff. Like one in three women experience birth trauma in our day and age. Mm -hmm. That's not out of the blue. Mm -hmm. That's because of what happened back there, you know. Mm -hmm. And part of the great experiment that I see is by welcoming daughters into their womanhood in an empowering way is mm -hmm. going to affect how they give birth. And mm. that not only is their story, but their baby's story and the father and the family. Mm. So like menstrual work, menarch work, mm. menarch healing impacts birth, which mm. has a massive effect. Mm. And then menopause, you know, like mm. everything that we have swept under the carpet, so to speak, throughout our lives, ignoring the menstrual cycle, whatnot, whatever, all comes out in menopause. Mm. So menstrual education can be preparation for menopause. Mm. And I was, you know, as I heard you both again, every time you speak, I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> so many, so many stories, so many things <laughs> it just sparks me up. <laughs> um, I was going to say that the one thing that saddens me is that all these, um, you, you talk about the trauma, one in three women, Oh no, three, what was the statistic of uh, uh, trauma in birth? How many women? One in three. One in three. I was gonna say that, for example, maybe 95% of my friends that gave birth in Brazil have had intervention and they're unaware of the trauma. Like they, have, they still haven't even reconciled the fact. That is also like a trauma, like Thomas Hubel talks beautifully about that, how numbness, 
how numbness is a sign of trauma. It's trauma. Like when we don't feel a part of ourselves, it's trauma. Trauma response. Mm. So, yeah. um, uh, so there's there's lots there that you shared. I um, I guess I wanted to maybe close. I see that we've been speaking for a while, and I want to close. Uh, invite you to share anything. Maybe you, your it can be final thoughts, or it can be even your your uh, hopes or inspiration for the future, or like a spell casting in this new moon. Of uh, because the one thing that I do see actually, and and I agree with you, Jane Bennett, when you say we don't know where our conversations go, and I think that my hope with this conversation and this podcast and 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 um. Is that I don't I don't really care where it goes, but I trust it will go and will spark people in some way, even if agitates people, if wake ups a little bit of numbness, or mm -hmm. if um, you know, if maybe husbands become curious, because sometimes in some context that I'm in, maybe the husband is more curious. It's like, oh, there's this woman in my community and she's been talking about this. So he might watch this before his wife. But then maybe it'll start something mm. in the opposite direction. Or um, so I, I think I, I'll just share my hopes. I'll start with um, with the hopes. With this is um, there is there are many people that talk about rites rites of passages, Jane, and I really learned a lot of from rites of passages from you. And then I deepened from different angles and spiritual practices and different things. But there's this um, modern day mystic called. Orland Bishop, and one thing that he does say, which to me does really land with the menstrual cycle, he says, you know, in a rite of passage, the rite of passage is complete when the culture treats you as the new person you are. You know, if a boy is sent out mm -hmm. and he becomes a warrior or a man, if the tribe doesn't treat him as the man that he, that he is, as the, as with the, so he needs to use his faculties and his new open to be that he'll be partially initiated like he, he needs this side here so my my side the side that i feel really called is to make sure that the people that are initiated by you it, we have a culture that reflects that to them that go like oh i want businesses that are inspired by women that, i want i want the, the new financial system to be created by the creativity of the masculine and feminine and no women trying to be a man so i want the new education system to be created by that i know i want i want the governments to have that reflected upon i want um so i'm i'm going maybe in the systems way um because i i i feel really called to having that side and i feel um i'm feeling hopeful uh you know it's slow as you say jane but when once i i let go that i might um you know i might not be alive maybe to see the result of that and that's not even the point that's actually not even the point that's not why i do it i do it because out of love it's just like it feels really um like a flower the blossoms uh, the flower cannot prevent itself from blossoming so maybe my desire is that you know my blossoming in in this way which is my way of my contribution will ripple in some way and maybe i'll see it maybe i won't see it but that's not not so relevant but i i trust that the seed we're planting is doing its thing in whatever space you know in it's doing its thing so uh yeah i'd love to hear your final thoughts mm -hmm. thanks thanks adriana final thoughts uh, uh, look i'm i'm actually really hopeful too uh and as Jane says, you know, I, I live in a bubble too, and I think we live in our bubbles are very either the same bubble or very connected, um, where we're very aware of, you know, the incredible things happening in this space, uh, the incredible initiatives to work through period poverty. I, I would be, say, just using that example, 
I think there, there are at least upward of, of, of 2,000 or more initiatives uh, around the world uh, to, to help eliminate period poverty. Now, that doesn't mean it's all done. There are a lot of women and girls who experience those difficulties, uh, but there are a lot of people very passionately and actively working to make a difference in, in that space. In uh, uh, we a few years ago, I think it was was it 2019? Um, we eliminated the uh, what they call the tampon tax in Australia, which really should never have been there in the first place, <laughs> I have to say. And that was there for 20 years and uh, brought in for the government around uh, half a billion dollars, which could wonderfully be rechanneled back into this these great needs. However, that's another conversation for another day. Mm -hmm. um, that has changed. We have free menstrual products in state schools in Victoria now. New South Wales is looking at it. South Australia has run a pilot. So, you know, those, while to us in this space, those are just logical things that perhaps could always have been there. But they haven't been there. And we're, if we just are conscious of where we're at, you know, what what maybe the space was, you know, 30, 20, 10 years ago, there's a lot of change and a lot of growth uh, in awareness and a lot of really passionate uh, women and men too in this blind uh, feeling parts of the elephant and saying, well, the elephant is like this or the elephant is like this. The... Um, you know, we're, we're all seeing the particular part that we can see that needs work and finding, you know, our role in it. None of us could do all of it <laughs> by any means. Uh, and I'm really heartened by the number of, uh, particularly women through my work, um, who are wanting to bring their skills and their heart and their service yeah. Uh, to this work in, in numerous ways in their community or in the global community. And to me, there's no shortage. It's, it's, it is, it's growing exponentially and uh, as it becomes logical to more and more people. Um, I, think I'll, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, I think that we also need to demand not ask for, demand, menstrual and menopause workplace policies. So um, this is happening in some big companies and some small companies and businesses, but it needs to be an accepted thing because otherwise women are not being treated properly, basically. And uh, so that definitely needs to happen. And there's all kinds of templates you can get to take to your work and maybe Adriana I can give you one that you could include in the show notes for people to have and so like when when the menstrual cycle gets brought to work and women uh, um, can have the opportunity to flow with whatever their body needs them to do or not do only then and it not be seen as sick leave because it's not sick, it's just the menstrual cycle, mm. then, then women will be receiving the appropriate um, care or able actually to do their own self-care. Mm. So that's like, I think, really important and next level with all of this. Mm. And also, you know, like we're in a bit of a pickle right now, humans on the earth. We've made a bit of a mess and, and um, we, we need to well what we know is that how a culture values the feminine is how they treat the earth and we've really messed that up mm -hmm. and so what we what we know we have to do is live an earth honoring and sustainable lifestyle and it makes me laugh and laugh because how to do that is hiding in plain view in the menstrual cycle so if everybody just lived like the menstrual cycle then we would be living an earth honoring and sustainable lifestyle. I mean, in a positive menstrual culture situation. And, and to do that, to reclaim our menstrual cycle. So for anybody who's thinking, oh, maybe I will, maybe I won't, oh, I can't be bothered. The benefit of reclaiming your menstrual cycle 
and basically putting how we started this whole conversation, Adriana, with putting your body back on your, your head, back on your body, like mm. your body can reconnecting your body and your head. And because menstrual shame leads to body shame and body shame leads to low self-esteem and low self-esteem leads to all manner of wounded behaviors, including self-harm, eating disorders and dangerous and sexual decision making. And mm we are encouraged to reject our menstrual cycle like there's even drugs marketed to be menstrual suppressors mm -hmm. and so if we reject our menstrual cycle which is how we're encouraged we reject our body if mm -hmm. we reject our body we reject ourselves and we're just heads so to put it back together to reclaim our body to inhabit our body to be embodied to mm -hmm. to reclaim the menstrual cycle is what that looks like for women then what will this awesome thing ha happens where we we experience being put in place or or emplacement mm. in the biosphere we find our way back to where we fit in the earth mm. so that would be the best medicine for now i think mm. reconnecting with our bodies and the earth because that's kind of where we need to go now with a big or else actually so that would be my closing words. Well, thank you both for making the time. It's been really great. It's been fun and insightful and beautiful to be with you, both pioneers. And you know, I, I'm happy that you mentioned other women that have been pioneering this work too. Um, and I'm gonna add, yeah, I'm gonna add some the details of your your websites and everything else in the in the notes. And yes, thank you so much for the work you do. And yeah, it's been beautiful. <laughs> thank you, Adriana. Mm. Thank you. It's been delightful. Great to, great to speak with you both. It's been so fun. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Witches cackling in the corner over here, talking about yeah. blood. <laughs> 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 <laughs>